Yeah. Uh, there's uh, prayer cards and uh, gift cards. You can bless somebody with a card in the foyer. That's our hope ministry. This is all about, there was an insert today about this family that lost everything. I'm going to continue to try to figure out how and where we can help. Hospitality needs you. Volunteer, how are we doing on volunteers for the carnival? Okay. Remember, there's no uh, message that night. I have to cook hot dogs. There'll be people coming from around the country to eat hot dogs that night. Or around the community. Cookies and brownies. How are we doing on cookies and brownies? Oh, Galen. Okay. Remember. What? No nuts. And... No crazy people either. All right? You got it? The Great Jungle Journey, GBS. I saw him working on all the poster things last week. Register, bring friends, talk about it in the neighborhood, talk it up. Elders meet tomorrow at 6. Remember the... Uh, Monday night Bible study that Joy teaches here. GBS school meeting, that's on the 21st. Newsletters coming up. And I guess that's it for announcements. Any other announcements? No? How about your prayer requests? Brother Gene. Donna's sister Lois uh, is in the VA hospital in Maryland with health, pretty serious health issues. Okay. Seek prayer for her. Amen. Donna's sister Lola. Others? Vicki? My sister Nancy Stokes goes in tomorrow. Uh, in Mississippi somewhere in town. But anyway, she's having a complete soldier, shoulder surgery. Okay. So shoulder replacement. Place. Barb? Well, I saw Mike and Amy today. And Mike looks a little like he's lost some weight, of course. But he said, I'm getting along just fine, Barb. So thank you guys for praying for him. So. Amen. Others? Oh, yeah. Pray for Israel. Yep. Anyone else? Okay, let's all stand. Brother Ron, will you give that to Brother Ron, Steve, please? Father, we thank you for this evening. Thank you that we could be in your house. And we just commit these prayer requests to you. We pray for uh, Donna's sister. We just Amen. pray for healing for her, Lord, and comfort her, Lord. Help her through this time. Um, we thank you for just answers to prayer, Lord, how you bless us. and. We do have a God we can pray to and ask for help, Lord. Pray for Israel. We ask that you would just uh, put your angels around that country Amen. now and protect them, Lord. There's, so, there's just so much evil over there. Amen. We just pray for their protection. For the other ones that are dealing with uh, different issues health-wise, Lord, we pray for them. We pray for 
that you would just uh, be with them and comfort them. Uh, give the doctors wisdom, Father. And now at this time, we just ask for your blessing upon this service, for our church, for our... Seems like Satan is always out there luring, trying to disrupt when we're... Things are going well, but he's just right there to stir things up. We just pray that you would bind him, Lord. Keep him Amen. away from us. Protect us, Lord. Thank you for all you do. Amen. Amen. Before you just uh, scripture from James 2, 14 through 20. James writes, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which they are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, it is dead. But someone will say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God you do well, even the demons believe and tremble. But you do but do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Thank you. Faith without works is dead. So, uh, this is a new section of scripture we start tonight, and it's called uh, A Faith That Is Dead. Uh, there's a notice by a psycho psychologist. I don't often quote psychologists, but I've read a couple books by Dr. Alfred Adler, A D L E R, and he holds an interesting theory of individual psychology. And he says, when you're dealing with people, trust only in their movement. Okay? Life happens at the level of action. He goes on to say, is, what he says is, we are not what we say, but we are what we do. What we do. That's the key to our intent. Trust only in people's movement. I think Adler, even though he's a psychologist, maybe he's studied the Word of God a little bit. He's discovered what James is saying here. He's observed human behavior from the viewpoint of psychology, that the only real revelation of a person is through that person's behavior. How do they act? Paraphrase what James says in these verses, faith plus nothing equals nothing. Faith plus nothing equals nothing. In fact, James will reference uh, in verse 17, he talks about work, uh, he talks about a, uh, a dead faith. Verse 20, he talks about a dead faith. Verse 26, he talks about dead faith. And the thing about people with dead faith is that they will always substitute what for their deeds. Their words. They will substitute their words for doing things. They may, they may want you to believe they are what they say, not what they do. But we have to, but we must not trust in words. Trust only in what people, the way it, they move. Okay? True faith will always be seen in people's words. Dead faith will not be seen at all. So the point I'm going to emphasize, and some would, some would pick a, 
uh, some would have a contention with me is that as you approach this passage, there is a kind of faith that does not save. As you approach this passage, there's a kind of faith that does not save. There's a kind of faith in God that does not save. There's a kind of faith in Christ that does not save. All right? Have I made my point? And I'm going to show you that scripturally, okay? So, it's not, it's not too hard to understand. Matthew chapter 3, the ministry of John the Baptist. I think this is really, uh, I think this might be the first sermon of the Bible. John the Baptist in the New Testament. John was baptizing all these people, remember, out in the River Jordan? People are confessing their sins. In verse 7, he begins his introductory sermon. When he saw the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, this is a way to start your sermon, brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Therefore, he says, therefore, listen to what he says, therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not think to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. What he's saying, don't count your heritage as part of your faith. Demonstrate your faith and the legitimacy of your faith by your work. Later, in Matthew 5, verse 16, Jesus says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good words, no, work, and glorify your Father who is in heaven. In other words, that light that shines out of the life of a believer is the light of good work, demonstrated deed. You know, we've been looking, we've been studying in Titus 2. Uh, Paul writes to Titus, and he tells, he tells the old men, this is what you old men need to do. He tells the older women, this is what you older women need to do. He tells the younger women, uh, this is what the older women are going to teach you to do. He tells the younger men, this is what you need to do. You know why? Because he's, he wants all of those people who have a behavior who have works that will shine like the light of Christ and thus lead people to Jesus. You can, you can, you can, anybody can talk. Not all people will work, okay? And when I say works, I don't mean physically toiling. I mean doing things for the Lord. Matthew 7, same Sermon on the Mount, verse 21. What does Jesus say? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of the Father in heaven. Okay? See, it's not, it's not the, necessarily the sayers, it's the doers. Remember? We read that earlier. Okay? Trust not in what people say, trust in what people do. This this is a continual emphasis in the ministry of Jesus. It's very, very prevalent in the Gospel of John. We've studied it over and over. John chapter 2, verse 23, it says this. Now when he, he being Jesus, was in Jerusalem at the Passover, follow along now, what did they do? Many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus, next verse, but Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. See, Jesus know, knew that they have a, had a level belief. But everybody needs a man to show what he believes. The word in your outline is the word show. Not just to say what you believe. How often have I asked people in counseling, are you saved? And they have told me yes. And then we go through 
their works. And their works stink. And so you can't believe what everybody tells you. Jesus knew who these people were. He knew what was in them. And he said they believed, but their belief was less than sufficient. Chapter 3, same idea. Who's, who's in chapter 3? Here comes Nicodemus, riding in on the Nicodemus train. Ruler of the Jews, very, very significant teacher. He's one who believed. This man came to Jesus by night and he said, Rabbi, notice the pronoun, pronoun. We know you are a teacher come from God, for no one else can do the signs or the miracles that you do unless God is with him. Just back in that previous chapter in 2.23, there's the people who believe in the name of Jesus. They believed that Jesus was sent from God. They may have even believed he was Messiah. And Nicodemus says, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. And what's the next verse? Yeah. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men. Now go back to Nicodemus. Nicodemus comes to Jesus, and he's not only representing himself, he's representing others. They believe it's a group of people, but Jesus answers him, and what does he say? He doesn't say your belief is enough. He says, most assuredly, I say to you, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. All right? So what's the point? Well, one point is they believe. Nicodemus may have well believed in the Messiahship of Jesus Christ. He believed in the miracles. He believed in the name. He believed that Jesus was sent from God. But Jesus said to him, <laughs> and to all who were like him, he said, your believing is not enough and you, unless you are what? What's, what's the thesis statement of the conversation with Nicodemus? You must be born again. Your belief is not enough. You must be born again. And oftentimes we, we will intrinsically say that, we, we will say, well, if you believe, that means you're born again. Not necessarily so. Not necessarily so. There are those that believe in certain things that aren't born again. There is a, such a thing as a non-saving faith. And so in chapter 8 in John, a graphic illustration of that kind of faith, verse 30 and 31, he, Jesus, spoke these words, and how many? Many believe in him. He spoke words relating to himself and his father. Many believed in him. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, see what he says, he, he, he acknowledges that they believe in him. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. See, he wanted them to take a further step. It's not salvation plus, it's just salvation. Okay, they believed in him. Remember when, when Jesus, uh, is it John 6, where he says, uh, you, you know, you got to eat my body, you got to drink my blood, et cetera, et cetera. And a lot of people got confused. A lot of his, a lot of his quote unquote disciples, what did they do? They left. They believed, but they left. And Jesus says, if you, if you are my real disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The truth will set you free from sin and bondage and death and hell and judgment. All of that's implied there. So in other words, they said they believed, and Jesus said, it's not enough. It's not enough unless you are born again, unless there's a new birth, which is, which is indicated by a transformation. And then I'll add this part, and this will make me a legalist which leads to a life of obedience. The valid saving faith has always been ver verified by, according to Jesus Christ, 
by fruit. The word in your outline is fruit. And dead faith is indicated by the ab absence of righteous actions in the life of those that profess to be believers. And it's clear that many people, this, this non-saving faith that I'm speaking of, it's clear that many people possess that kind of faith. They believe in God, they believe in Christ, but not to the point of transformation. They may believe the facts of God, the facts of Christ, but they do not manifest no irrevocable commitment to Jesus Christ. They don't manifest a life change that comes via true salvation, marked by repentance and obedience. And that's how we know people who have been in church for decades and turn their back on Christ and walk away. And the Lord was so concerned about this condition, he spoke about it in the parable of the soils, remember? He spoke about it, no doubt, he alluded it in regards to the wheat and the tares. He spoke about it in John 15 with the abiding and non-abiding branches. He spoke about it in Matthew 7 with the professors of faith and the possessors of faith. So it was a very common issue in the ministry of Jesus Christ. Intellectual belief, beloved, is not enough. And that's very, very, very vividly ex exhibited in the narrow gate. Intellectual belief is not enough. Hebrews 12, 14 says, Holiness without which no man, no man can see the Lord. See, if you are not in some way, on some level, holy, you cannot see the Lord. No one ever enters into the presence of the Lord without holiness. Have you thought of yourself being holy today? So we conclude that, that justification must have more with it than just a forensic statement about your position in regards to Jesus. It must have, along with it, a real sanctification. So that saving faith is manifest in your work. Paul said we are God's workmanship, creating Christ Jesus for good work, which God prepared beforehand so that we should walk in them. And this is, you know, you know, this is a burden. Uh, I believe, I think, do you understand what I'm saying? Does everybody understand what I'm saying? And the church doesn't want to look at that. The church wants to say, I'm okay, you're okay. Okay? And so we must deal with the deception and the delusion that knowing the truth equals de deception. It's almost as people think that, uh, that what you do, you don't deny, you must believe. And that will make that'll be sufficient. Well, that's not sufficient. And what James is doing when he writes this letter is he is he he is he is uh, taking a stand that he will not permit such such deception to go on unchallenged in the churches that he's writing to. People who believe the facts of the gospel, but don't make an irrevocable commitment shun sin and serve Jesus, which commitment is, uh, listen, if you, how does that work? How does one believe in Christ and not have a commitment to shun sin and not have a commitment to serve the Lord? Our commitment should be saving faith equals commitment equals works. I could put obedience and I could put a lot of things in that chain, 
But we have, we, as we look at what James, or James is writing, all he's done, he's given all these people, remember? How do you respond to, respond to trial? How do you respond to temptation? How do you respond to the world, the word? How, are you, how do you respond to, or respond to partiality? All he's doing is giving people tests, and here's a test. Do you exhibit living faith in your life, or do you have a dead faith? That's what he's saying. And it's not that he's just talking about it in chapter 2. If you look in chapter 1 and verse 22, what did he say then? Be ye doers of the word, and don't be hearers all only. Because when you do that, what do you do? You deceive yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face, remember? I told you that means his, the face of his birth. The idea is his Genesis face. It's his natural face. He looks at his face in a mirror and he observes himself and he sees who he is and how he is and what does he do? He immediately goes away and he forgets who he is. You know why he forgets who he is? Because he wants to. He doesn't like what he sees. He looks, he sees the problem, and he does nothing about it. And he goes away and he forgets about it. Well, what good is that? But then he says, he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, the word of God, and continues in it, he is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of work. This one will be blessed in what he does. In other words, God says, you need to be a doer, a continuer. All of these words have the, 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 in the context where they're, they're written in, it means to be continual, a continuer in looking in the word of God and putting it into practice in your life. And again, James brings up the same issue here in chapter 2. And, and just so we make sure that we all understand each other, no one is saved by work, okay? I'll say it again. No one is saved by work, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Not of works, less what? Less we should boast. We're not saved by our work. If we're saved by work, listen, if you're saved by work, you know what that does? That adulterates grace. You don't need grace. You're saved by work. No one is saved by work. Listen carefully, but, but no one is saved without producing work. And that's the issue. That's what James is writing about. Unless you find something different. The, the works of repentance and submission in Christ being, listen, when you get saved, you, the moment you're saved, you're work. You have work. You know what your first work is? You've repented. You know what your second work is? You've submitted. Those are your first two works of those who are saved. And some are saved, or they, 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 they either say they are or they think they are, and they never repent, and they never submit. And that's the kind of faith we're talking about. In Matthew 13, 44 to 46, our Lord gives two parables. Remember, there's uh, the man who finds a treasure in the, the, the field. And then there's a guy who found a great pearl, a great pri a prize. Uh, and in both instances, what do they do? They, they, it's, they sell how much? All that they have. What's the treasure in the field? Salvation. Yeah. What's the pearl of great price? Salvation. And what do you have to do to give it, to get it? Give all. And there's a sense in which salvation comes to those who give all they are and have to cry to take all that he is and have it for their own. It's only equitable, isn't it? If you're going to take all of him, and he's going to take all of you. That sounds like a, 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 an equitable deal. There's a sense we have to give all of ourselves to have all of him. The, the pieces that you hang on to are pieces of junk. 
But the self-deceived, for them, faith is nothing more, I'll use the word, a carnal glance, and the acknowledgement of the facts about God and Christ. They know the facts. There's no, there's no commitment to an obedient life, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, to obey his will. And so James is dealing with this dead faith, non-saving faith, and that's the issue. Let me stop. Questions or comments? Hold on. Uh, Steve? Barb? Right there. When somebody has genuine faith, I don't know how the whole... They can't have the Holy Spirit if they don't. To me, there's no Holy well, Spirit in their life. I agree. So. Amen. Bob? I know. I talk to a lot of people about Jesus, and I find that a lot of people that say they're believers, they know about Jesus, but they don't really know Jesus. Amen. Yeah, they know the facts, or some of the facts. And, and I'll tell you, I have a great passion for this whole idea because in, in my ministry, in the, in, in the school where I work with quote-unquote Christian parents and children, and with the church people I've worked with, quote-unquote Christian, I've seen many, many people just walk away from everything. And I at once had thought they believed. And when they walked away, it was an evidence of the deadness of their faith. And every one of those people, if I sat down here right now with a piece of paper, maybe two pieces of paper, I could write down their name. You know why? Because I can still see their faces. They were professors of faith who were not possessors of faith. When it came down to the test of righteous deeds, they, they had none. No matter how much they may have claimed to have faith, their faith proved to be dead. It's what Barb said. And when I think to myself, ah, and when I think, and so, so how many people do I know? I don't know? I don't know that many people. How many other people are there? who claim faith, who have a dead faith. How many other people are, are like them who are in this life and never manifest living faith? I don't have that long to do this. I don't know how much longer I'll do this. And I don't want to see people wake up in hell and wonder what happened. Because some people, listen, part of the problem is self-deception. It's just plain old self-deception. Well, let me give you, give you a little bit of an idea what some of the folks James was writing to, I think, were thinking. Because it, 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 it's important to understand the context in which the letter is written, especially in regards to works. Most of the people he's writing to have spent the majority of their life in Judaism. I think we can, we can say that. And in Judaism, there was a tremendous amount of stress placed on what? Work. Because by this time in the history of Judaism, Judaism has become totally a works righteousness system. And they, these people were, were raised to believe in the efficacy of work. And here comes Jesus Christ. And he says, I have a gracious gospel of salvation. And for many people, that gospel seemed to them to be joyous. Imagine living your life under a system of work, knowing you couldn't live up to the system, being required to keep laws, 
you know you couldn't keep. Imagine being absolutely overwhelmed by all the rules that no human being could ever live up to and believing that your salvation was dependent upon your ability to do what you couldn't do. That's a pretty big burden, isn't it? If you worry about those things, that's a pretty big burden. In fact, in Jesus, uh, Matthew 23, Jesus said to the religious leaders, you're the ones that espouse this system. And he actually, he, he said, you bind on people burdens far too heavy for them to bear. He actually said you tie it onto them. You place these heavy, heavy burdens on them, and they can't stand it. And so here you have these Je Jewish people, typically oppressed by what is a guilt-producing burden. You know, if you, can get to, if you can get people to believe that they're guilty all the time, you can keep them in line. And that's part of what the scribes and Pharisees did. And, but then here comes along this, this, this gospel preaching of Jesus Christ, and it's all about grace, and it's about liberation, and it's about freedom. And it's all about joy and love. And they hear the gospel and they say, wow, that's for me. I want some of that stuff. That's great. Freedom from legalism. It sounded too good to be true. And it might be that some of these that James writes to in this letter that he writes have misunderstood the freedom and they went too far in the other direction going all the way from legalism to unfounded and abusive liberty. They may have fallen on the mistaken notion that since works were not efficacious for salvation, maybe they weren't efficacious for anything, and maybe they weren't even necessary. And it could be that James was recognizing that in the congregation that he wrote to, that some people were trying to espouse a salvation that was simply believe the fact, and it required nothing else from you. I don't think that sounds too far-fetched. In fact, it's not my idea. It's other commentarians' idea. But I don't think it sounds far-fetched, and I'll add that in some way or another. I think that idea has been espoused for centuries. All you got to do is believe the fact. Because it's nothing but a lie straight from the pit of hell. And an illustration of this kind of legalism that these Jews might have come under comes up, uh, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. This is from an ancient rabbinic writing. I found it in the Expositor's Greek Testament. It said this, when Mar Ukba lie dying, some guy named Mar, he's, die, he's laying around dying, and he asked for his account. It amounted to 7,000 zumum. That's how much money he's given to Judaism. In other words, it's as if he has an account in heaven. All that he's been given, God has kept a record of it. And he's given up this 7,000 zumbum. And then he cries out when he sees that, that figure, and he says, the way is far. He says, it's a long way to get to God. And the provision is small. He didn't think he had enough to get him to God. He wasn't sure. He wasn't sure if what he had done was enough in the sight of God to get him to heaven. And so what does he do? It says he sells all his fortune. And in that way, he makes himself quite secure. He gives everything he has to God. That's rabbinic teaching. You know, the Jews were always earning their way with their work. In fact, in the, in the first and second century, you can read some of the writings of the pagans around Israel that indicated that they accused the Jews of joining Christianity because it was a cheaper religion than Judaism. Become a Christian, you won't spend as much money. <laughs> and the new message of Christianity, grace, freedom, liberty, faith, mercy, 
It looked like a, a total, uh, it was such a relief to these people to believe that. And so they went from legalism to antinomianism. Do you know what antinomianism is? It's, it's where you are released by grace from any obligation to observing any moral law. Law. It means because of God's grace, you don't have to do, you don't have to be moral. <laughs> and so James writes this letter. There may have been some that were in that condition that he writes to. And whatever the cause and the background, there were some who felt themselves secure just by being hearers of the word. And they were self-deceived. They were saying, oh, yeah, we've heard the word. We know the facts of the word. But that word was never fleshed out in their life. And some of you probably know people like that, don't you? People that know the facts. You know, you ask people, do you believe in God? And what do they say? Yes. Do you believe that Jesus Christ lived and died and rose from the dead? And what do they say? Yes. And you know as well as I do that they're, they're not Christians by their work. They have none. Or their fruit is rotten. And that's not un un uncommon in any way, shape, or form. They possess, I believe, is a dead faith. You remember that song, don't you? Only believe, only believe, all things are possible if you only believe. Well, that's what the song says. And the song in that context is probably correct. But I think, I've thought, you know, Nicodemus believed. Before he came to Christ, he believed in who Christ was. But Christ told him, you need something more, Nicodemus. You need to be born again. It was not enough just to believe, unless the faith is the faith that saves and transforms, then it's enough to believe. Because that's real belief. What's the character of dead faith? I'm almost done. And I think that's what James wants to point out. Let's look at this text, finally. We won't get very far. <laughs> that was my introduction for this section. What is the character of dead faith? And he gives us three markers, indicators of dead faith. Three descriptions of the nature of dead faith. First of all, he identifies dead faith by an empty confession. An empty confession. Verse 14, what does it profit, another way to put it, of what benefit is it? My brethren, he's speaking to his Jewish brethren, a Jewish audience, collectively as a church, outward, they're inward, they would be known collectively as a church, outwardly as his brethren. What does it profit or what benefit is it if someone says he has faith, but he does not have work? What, what good is the claim, is what he's saying. Don't look at the end, look at the beginning. What good is their claim if they don't have any work? Can faith save them? If a man says he has faith for the sake of an argument, a man comes along, he could make that claim. I have faith, I believe, I believe in God. I believe in Christ. He confesses to believe in the death of Christ. He may con confess to believe in the resurrection of Christ all the way. But what does it profit, my brothers, if someone continually goes on to make the claim that he has faith, that's the way it's written, continually goes on on making the claim that he has faith, but he, he does not have erga. He does not have works. He does not produce a product. Is the Greek idea. He, has, he doesn't have righteous deeds. Righteous deeds are not a pattern of his life. I'm going to talk about that word pattern 
on Wednesday night. In Titus 2, it talks about, and in, yeah, yeah, it, uh, Paul tells Titus, you need to have this example or this pattern in your life. You know where that word comes from? It's from, it's also in the gospel. It's the word that's used to describe the imprint on the nails of Jesus' hand. The example of your life. What's your product? If you don't have good works, what's your product? Righteous deeds should be a pattern, an example of your life. What good's your faith if you don't have work? And of course, the answer is it's not good at all. That's the obvious answer. There's nothing but an empty confession, an empty profession, a claim with no evidence. But there's, if, there, if there are no works, and no righteous deed, you cannot demonstrate a changed life. And you know some of what I'm teaching is directly against what some people believe in the evangelical church. If when true faith is placed in Christ, we receive what? We become a new creation. We have a new nature. And that new nature then hides so no one can see it. No, that new nature has to manifest itself. Go to the parable of the soils again. Good soil produces what? Fruit. The fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of righteousness. And if we look at James, he's going to show us, what we're going to do is he's going to show us these works. And we can go all the way back to chapter 1, verse 12, and he'll show us what the first demonstration of true faith is. Blessed is the man who what? Endures. Endurance, I believe, is a work of true faith. Patient, triumphant, enduring through trials and tribulations, a good work demonstrating good faith. That's one of the tests. Questions or comments? Roger. <laughs> you know, it, it makes me think that um, that the other benefit from works is that it it, it ex, I don't know if accelerates is the right word, but it helps you grow. Oh yeah. In your belief, to for example, pick on Brother Bob. He goes door to door. He understands more what people need, or he understands how to read people of what they need to, in order to introduce Christ to them. But if, because if you, if you don't do these things, some of it's going to be miserable, but it helps in your, it helps in your growth. That's towards perfection, which is, we can't reach, but we have to give our best shot at. Yeah. Good works are fortifying. They make you stronger. And, and faith without works is indicative of, of weakness. But you got to always got to remember, you got to flip the coin. What's works without faith? Damnation. You got to remember that part too. Okay. <laughs> Don't you love the Word of God? I I, I do. Brother Ron. So the thief on the cross, all he had was faith. Yep. He had no works. That was his first work, his faith. And then his second work, he submitted to Jesus Christ and acknowledged who he was. That was his work. When you come to salvation, you begin your works. When you bend your knee to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that's your first work. The question is, will you continue in work? Because oftentimes people will say that they've bent their knee, and one day everyone will. But they say they have, but they haven't. 
And those are the ones we have to be worried about. Because they're all around us. Some of them are our friends. Some of them might be our family. They're all around us. We need to be concerned about people. All right? Anyone else? Let's all stand. Thanks for coming. <clears throat> if you weren't here, I'd be very lonely. But I'd still teach because there's people out there. <laughs> I hope. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to uh, divide your word. I pray, Lord, that uh, we'll be able to take this teaching. Uh, and I pray, Lord, that uh, when we uh, finish this, uh, that all those who uh, have the opportunity uh, to hear it will understand it better than I do. Because I'll admit, Lord, it's not always easy to understand. But I do believe you place the truth before us because you want us to find it. We can find the truth. We may not always understand it, but we can find it. And in that, we can take great consolation that you place it there for us for a reason, for us to follow. So forgive us, Father, where we fail you. Be with us with it during this upcoming week. And we thank you, Father, for your love.